English Espanol. Some time ago I made a video with the title I has hashtag addiction. Hace algún tiempo he hecho un video con el título Tengo adicción a los hashtags. So at the moment my favorite hashtags are Bitcoin per minute and now just sometime and this new one let's talk fe which rhymes with let's talk bitcoin but let's talk fe bueno mis dos hashtags favoritos son en inglés es bitcoin per minute en español también tengo una cuenta en twitter eh, bitcoin por minuto y um, hace poco ahora he creado un nuevo hashtag Let's Talk FE es un poco secreto I watched many videos um, about this topic Let's Talk FE but um, bueno he mirado muchos videos sobre este tema de Let's Talk FE and at the moment, I must say, my favorite channel is of Mark Sargent. Y tengo que decir que sobre este tema de momento es mi canal favorito, el canal de Mark Sargent. Sorry, Mark S. Sargent, written together. Perdona, Mark S. Sargent, escrito juntos. By the way, my last video, number 64, is a remix uh, with um, a compilation of his videos. Mi último video, número 64, es una composición de varios, una serie de videos que hizo Mark Sargent. The reason why I want to connect these two hashtags La razón por que estoy conectando estos dos hashtags I saw that in the end of the video Mark Sargent gives his phone number He visto al final del video que Mark Sargent da su número de teléfono and of course, at first I thought of my own allergy against answering the phone. <laughs> bueno, primero pensé en mi propia alergia de en contra de contestar el teléfono. Since long time, I have a dream to throw my phone out of the window into the swimming pool. <laughs> Desde mucho tiempo. Tengo el sueño de tirar mi teléfono fuera de la ventana, adentro de la piscina. Ok, forget about that. What I want to, um, not just for Mark Sargent, but many others who are doing a great job in um, exploring this complicated topic of Let's Talk FE. Bueno, no es solo por Mark Sargent, sino muchas otra gente que hacen un gran trabajo de explorar ese tema complicado de Let's Talk FE. Ok, um, just want to say long time, I have written on my to-do list to open my own channel of Bitcoin per minute. Bueno, ya hace tiempo tengo escrito en mi lista de tareas por hacer de abrir mi propio canal de Bitcoin por minuto. Did you hear of Streamium, which is a decentralized system of um, streaming online video? Has oído de Streamium? que es un sistema descentralizado de um, streaming, que quiere decir uh, de ver videos en línea por internet. Later I'll paste a video from Let's Talk Bitcoin where they are discussing this um, 
Streamium without uh, using the word Bitcoin per minute, but uh, actually, in my opinion, um, bueno, más tarde voy a pegar un video mm, sobre ese tema de Streamium de Let's Talk Bitcoin. Um, uh, actually, I prefer, okay, Streamium is the technology, but um, it doesn't express that it's um, the payment is Bitcoin. So I like very much the hashtag Bitcoin per minute. And it's not just uh, the idea of uh, streaming, but other um, applications um, which you can measure in per minute. Bueno, yo prefiero eh, la expresión Bitcoin por minuto porque no es solo de vídeos, sino cualquier um, aplicación que se puede medir en minutos. Claro, Bitcoin por minutos. The most interesting um, thing about um, Streamium is that it's, uh, I repeat, it's decentralized, P2P, which means that uh, there is no middleman. So, um, so the content producer and gets 100% um, of this, um, of the customer. Lo más interesante es en que el productor de contenido él recibe el 100% del dinero del, um, del consumidor. And the content producer can uh, freely decide the amount, how much Bitcoin per minute he or she wants. Y el productor o productora de contenido puede establecer libremente la cantidad de Bitcoin por minuto, lo que quiere del consumidor. Of course, this is a most interesting, not most interesting, okay, the first people who will adopt this are these webcam girls and not just girls. Um, por supuesto, la primera En primer lugar son los chicas de webcam, que no solo no son solo chicas, sino también chicos. Because in these normal sites, um, the websites um, demand almost half of this amount for themselves. Porque en estos páginas web de webcam ellos eh, cobran casi um, la mitad de esta esta suma but just before i'll paste two short videos about this topic of, of let's talk fe pero antes voy a pegar um, dos videos cortitos sobre el tema de Let's Talk FE. I invented this hashtag Let's Talk FE because it's very difficult to, to talk about this topic FE. You know what I mean, flat earth. Bueno, yo he inventado este hashtag Let's Talk FE porque es muy difícil de hablar sobre este tema de FE. Ya sabéis lo que quiero decir. Tierra plana. So if you talk about somebody, or if you start talking about some, with somebody about this topic, don't mention flat earth. Instead, use this hashtag, ha, new hashtag, Let's Talk FE. Así que cuando empiezas a hablar uh, con alguien sobre este tema de tierra plana, 
no uses esa palabra porque te van a decir, estás loco, loca. Así que usa este nuevo hashtag, Let's Talk FE. Or now enjoy these two videos and later um, about Bitcoin per minute. Bueno, que ahora disfruta ese, este dos videos cortitos sobre el tema de Let's Talk FE y después el tema de Bitcoin por minuto, Streamium. this flat earth subject I dismissed it without even giving it a second thought but more recently at the beginning of 2015 I ran across a few flat earth videos again and while looking into the fake moon photos circulating around I saw that people were claiming that the images from earth from space were fake as well pretty soon the flat earth subject became viral online and after looking at the Apollo missions one night and coming to the conclusion that they were nothing more than a huge con game it jarred my memory about something and for a very specific reason, I decided to look deeply into the flat earth without just dismissing it blindly as so many do. Why did I look into it this time? Well, I do pray for knowledge and wisdom and discernment, but maybe the recent Apollo footage I watched helped. However, I live near a very large lake, Lake Ontario, and I happen to remember going to the beach as a kid and looking across the lake and seeing New York State coast off in the distance. I never ever thought anything about it ever, except I remember it being there when I went to the beach. Now, I've been to that beach a hundred times over the years, and once this topic gained more prominence in early 2015, the first video I saw explained the curvature of the Earth and what it's supposed to be in inches per mile. And it resonated with me because I remember that I could see clear across the lake to the other coast, something that broke all the sphere Earth rules. So with NASA fakery on my mind and the memory of seeing this coastline that supposedly was too far below the horizon for me to be able to see it due to the curvature of the Earth, I re-examined the Flat Earth Theory. And as unbelievable as it seemed, it started to make a lot of sense, especially since I did distinctly remember being able to see that far coast basically any time I was at my local beach. And as I've said, I've been there hundreds of times over the years. But even so, I went back to the beach recently and stood at the shore. I looked south and guess what? I could see the New York State coastline just like I remember. Now I googled the distance and it was approximately 36 miles. I learned what the curvature of the Earth is supposed to be exactly at that distance. And according to the people that believe in the sphere, I found out that the coast should have been buried below my ability to see it by almost 900 feet. That part of the New York State coast had a top elevation of less than 300 feet. So that left at least a huge 600 foot discrepancy and even more because I could see some of the height of the far shore. Was something really wrong with the reality that they've been selling us ever since we were born? Well, I ended up becoming a little fixated on proving or disproving the concept. And at first, I truly thought disproving the flat earth would be rather easy. I thought there had to be a reasonable explanation why I could see so far beyond the so-called curved barrier. I learned about light refraction and superior mirages. I learned about perspective and horizons. I learned about how our eyes work. I viewed dozens of similar experiences on YouTube. I listened to experts and people who thought they had logical but spherical explanations. In fact, I tried for a few months to debunk the concept and just couldn't. The more I looked into it, the more sense it made and the less likely that the sphere model we've been spoon-fed since birth was a reality. It's just flat out wrong. And as more people shared their experiences and proofs online, it only added to my growing, pretty much unwavering belief that the world is not what we've been told. And learning about how our eyes work and how perspective work helps a lot with understanding sunrises and sunsets and ships disappearing hull first at sea and other supposed sphere earth proofs. I can't say for certain what shape the earth is or how big it is, or if there's an Antarctic ring or a barrier beyond it, or if it's an infinite plane. Maybe everything we theorize is not complete. 
There are so many possibilities that it blows the mind. And the flat earth has no real complete standard model because it's all based on us finding out things for ourselves. We agree on the facts and certain basics, but the rest is only hypothetical even if it seemingly makes sense. And as the evidence mounts for both the flat earth and against the sphere, I wanted to create a special place where folks can learn and share what they've learned with other supporters. Differences of opinion are certainly going to come forth and should be expressed openly. But remember that the goal of my videos and their corresponding threads is to provide the opportunity to use each of us to learn and grow in any area that any of us has a problem in. If there is a thing you can't understand, then ask. Someone will have an opinion and we can go from there. If you have a point to make against what is considered an accepted flat earth fact, please provide any relevant links or supporting proofs or videos. I am currently under the impression that the entire space program, even low Earth orbit, and all that is there, is really just a sleight of hand trick by a group of illusionists that have swindled the public, the governments of the world, the media, and us into believing a lie. Everybody, a small group of corporations and cabals have almost complete control over the entire financial, educational, high-level governmental and media systems, leaving it up to real armchair scientists and normal people that can critically think and recreate experiments themselves to independently prove or disprove prove any accepted line of thought about our reality. Look, I ain't the smartest man on the flat earth, but I ain't no dummy. I'm educated and I never ever questioned or ever thought of an alternative to a sphere earth until this year. It never entered my mind to question this part of our reality at all, ever. But now I question everything. I'm a Christian and I think I see the big picture. Thanks, Thanks for watching my video. If you'd like to see more proof against the heliocentric model and proof against the sphere, then make sure to subscribe to my channel. And if there's anything you disagree with, Make sure you leave a note below explaining exactly why. Remember folks, follow the golden rule. God loves you. We'll talk soon. It's the 6th of June, 2015, and this is episode 219. This show is intended for informational and educational purposes only. What cryptocurrency enables is new, empowering, and exciting, but we're not experts. Just obsessed companions walking the road towards a more peer-to-peer -peer future. Twenty fourteen was arguably the year of multi-signature and hierarchical deterministic wallets in Bitcoin, two major innovations that are beginning to impact every aspect of the Bitcoin ecosystem. I thought it was the year of the booty. <laughs> what? Sorry. Sorry. What? <laughs> the, the, well, this is the the you guys didn't hear about that. No. It's the year of the, the booty. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> like like <laughs> it went right over your heads. Just yeah, kidding. Sorry. Completely. I, I don't <laughs> <pick up. laughs> No, because like all these pop like stars have big butts and like it became cool to have a big butt instead of being like an ob a thing of shame like you're too fat you know all right, all right. well well so it seems like clearly there are two things that happened in 2014 <laughs> there was well, multi-sig and butts i was specifically talking about bitcoin although arguably bitcoin's entire social community has been heavily influenced by butcoin so therefore i can see the connection My impression is that 2015 will become the year of micropayments. And we're beginning to see a lot of activity in the micropayment space, especially around a technology called payment channels. And payment channels have already been used for a number of different projects or proposed for a number of different projects. And we're seeing a lot of development in this space. For example, the Lightning Project, which is a payment channel solution that can enable microtransactions and off-blockchain transactions, is proposed as a potential solution to the block size limits and a way to reduce the burden on the blockchain for a lot of the smaller transactions. We've seen a friend of our show here, Chris Ellis, has launched a Pro Tip, which is a decentralized tipping platform. Just a week ago, a group of incredibly talented developers from Buenos Aires, Argentina, including Manuel Arauz, 
and Esteban and uh, a few others, I, I don't remember all the names, launched Streamium. And Streamium is a platform for streaming video and receiving payments by the second micropayments, essentially, again, using payment channels to enable per second billing. We've seen a, another proposal by Mike Hearn getting traction for per second billing payment channels. And one of the potential applications for that is in renting space on a Wi-Fi access point. Again, payments by the second in a decentralized way that doesn't require you to have an account set up. All of these technologies share this common theme. They're using different variations of the of the concept of a payment channel which aggregates lots of little payments into into a few larger transactions and they're all bringing forth the promise of microtransactions in bitcoin and the reason i find this extremely exciting is because unlike many of the previous applications we've seen in bitcoin micropayments are something that you can't do with any other payment network out there so this is truly a unique niche, potentially a killer app, where the only way to do this is to have a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin. So the reason why microtransactions have not taken off to this point has a lot to do with the per transaction transaction fee. And the solution that you're talking about, whether it be the Lightning Network or one of these others, doesn't do that. Like you said, it's aggregating lots of transactions into a single transaction or, or to fewer transactions. How does it do that without impacting decentralization? How does it do that without requiring me to trust somebody who isn't the Bitcoin blockchain? Actually, Adam, I was going to say the exact same thing. This is the big issue with any kind of off-chain transaction is what's the trade-off between potentially centralization and convenience and enabling micropayments to happen? Satoshi was talking about kind of like what you just mentioned, like streaming video paying for Wi-Fi access by the minute or little payments, buying little small things on websites. Satoshi was talking about that way back at the beginning of Bitcoin and the value of Bitcoin has changed since then. So Satoshi was sort of thinking of it in terms of, well, you'd send one Bitcoin for 10 minutes of video or something like that. Obviously, the transaction fees at some point did sort of become prohibitive for those little transactions to really be feasible. And also there's the aspect of not wanting to introduce the idea of a trusted third party. If you have to trust some website to hang on to your Bitcoin and then sort of move some out of your account, depending on when you get billed, that's a little more trust than some people in the Bitcoin community are comfortable with. And it kind of defeats <laughs> the purpose of Bitcoin, if you consider that the purpose of Bitcoin. Yeah, what do we do? Payment channels solve this problem by introducing a decentralized way of making lots of little payments and aggregating them into account. The way this works is using two core features of the Bitcoin protocol, or at least one of them is core, the other one's more recent, and those are multi-signatures and end lock time. Multi-signatures introduced in early 2013. Uh, and lock time was, was part of the design since I believe 2010, or it might even go before then. Multisig, I think everybody is familiar with at this point. And lock time is essentially the ability to post date a transaction. So the ability to say, here's a transaction, it's fully signed, but it is not valid until some point in the future. You can either define that in a number of blocks or in a number of seconds that transaction will not be mined until that time in the future arrives. So the way you combine this is something I've talked about before. I've also talked about it using a similar system to do refundable escrow for buying products, so you can do consumer protection. But the, the idea is really simple. What you do is you create a multi-sig transaction that transfers a fairly large amount from Alice to Bob, Essentially, you fund that multi-sig address, and then you have a transaction from that multi-sig address that refunds Alice, but that transaction is post-dated, say 30 days into the future. In order to make micropayments from Alice to Bob, you exchange signed transactions for just the, the small amount that needs to be done, but you don't actually process those until you want to settle the account, if you like. So the original transaction locks, let's say, a Bitcoin into the payment channel. 
that Bitcoin will be refunded in the future if nothing happens. And then you do micropayments by creating intermediary transactions, essentially, that distribute the funds to Bob on a micropayment basis. Essentially, you've made a, an overall commitment of one Bitcoin, and then you make micro commitments in the meantime. At the end of the day, you only execute one transaction for the aggregate traffic back and forth in that payment channel. Can we just stop for a minute? Because I actually didn't know about this, but that's really cool and useful. I'm just thinking of the last time I postdated a check and it didn't work out. They actually cashed it before, <laughs> before I had dated it and didn't have a cash flow issue on that one, but could have easily. So this is kind of a way better system. Because end lock time is a consensus rule. So a transaction is not valid if its end lock time has not yet passed. It's not valid by the consensus rules on the network. So if you post a Bitcoin transaction using end lock time, you cannot mine that transaction into a block. No one can mine that transaction into a block because that block will not be a valid block because it is not a valid transaction unless the end lock time has passed. So you've got a guarantee there. And because you have that guarantee together with the guarantee of multi-signatures, you can enable this payment channel. Now, payment channels are not a new technology. They've been discussed now for, I guess, about two years, maybe a bit more. Uh, what's interesting is now we're seeing um, additional innovation piled on top of that. So the Lightning Network is an extension of payment channels. Where payment channels only happens between two people, the Lightning Network allows you to set up a sort of hub and spoke system of multiple interlinked payment channels for micropayments between multiple parties, all guaranteed in a completely decentralized fashion by this combination of multi-signature and post-dated transactions. It's some really fancy and very smart math, and it works. Lightning Network is still in the proposal stage, but payment channels are currently implemented in a number of different applications, one of which is, for example, Streamium. So with Streamium, what you do is you commit upfront a certain amount of money. Let's say you have a video that it charges $15 an hour to watch, and you want to watch some of that video, but you don't know how much time you want to watch, you don't know how much you're going to end up watching, and you don't want to pay in advance for all of it. So what you do is you basically commit, let's say you commit $15 but you also provide a refund address for whatever unused time you have. You're not actually charged that money yet. It's just locked up in a multi-sig transaction. You start watching the video. You're effectively billed by the second. And at the end of it, a single transaction records the actual amount of time you watched and how much you should pay. And the rest of it is returned to you in a refund. Um, and so that way you can get billed by the second, the provider of the stream, is guaranteed that they will get paid for the seconds that you watch. You're guaranteed that you will get a refund for the seconds you didn't watch. The entire thing doesn't have to happen with a per second transaction, so you're still getting the micropayment effect, but only a single transaction goes into the network. It's like a micro micro payment. It's even beyond, you know, micro payments. I think, you know, if you could just purchase a single video and it costs 25 cents or something like that, that strikes me as a micro payment. What we're talking about here is more of like a, a metered usage. Pre -auth I don't even know necessarily. What it's a payment channel. <laughs> well, exactly. But you could use this over longer periods of time. It doesn't have to be real time. For example, you could set up a payment channel between myself as a reader and Let's Talk Bitcoin content, put aside a Bitcoin or a tenth of a Bitcoin for reading Let's Talk Bitcoin content, and then over 30 days do a lot of microtransactions, you know, one cent, two cent, three cent, for pieces of content that I'm reading on Let's Talk Bitcoin, and essentially at the end of the month, settle up with a single transaction in a way that's decentralized. You know, the, the key here is that I'm not prepaying Let's Talk Bitcoin. I'm not giving the money over to Let's Talk Bitcoin and then hoping for a refund later. Essentially, I'm providing signatures on per content basis for each one of these microtransactions, and none of them go through until the end of the period. Essentially, that gives me full control over the micropayments. The money is effectively held in escrow. Let's Talk Bitcoin can take more than I've given them in the payment channel, and I will settle up at the end of the month. So you can use it real time, but you can also use it for bits of content. 
What's the dispute process, though? What happens if there's a dispute like, oh, yeah, I didn't read 20 articles, but Let's Talk Bitcoin is saying I did. Well, no, it doesn't work that way, because every time you read an article, you sign a, a microtransaction, if you like, into the payment channel. But that transaction doesn't get recorded on the blockchain. In the end, all of it's aggregated into a single transaction. So essentially, you have this overall agreement that has the, the full amount that's been authorized. But if you're issuing a bunch of little changes to that, but not submitting them to the Bitcoin blockchain, then how does the system or how does the network know which is the actual correct one? Now, why couldn't I, as a user, submit the one from you know the second day of a 30-day contract? Let me describe it in a bit more detail. So first of all, let's say I'm putting a Bitcoin into escrow into this payment channel, right? A whole Bitcoin. Now, I put it into a multi-signature escrow. We both sign a refund for the full Bitcoin a month from now. I then use a piece of content. So I sign a transaction for a thousandth of a Bitcoin that pays from this multi-signature address to Let's Talk Bitcoin. Let's Talk Bitcoin receives this transaction. They can countersign it and submit it, in which case they get paid a tenth of a Bitcoin. Or they can wait. I read another piece of content. Two days later, I sign a new transaction that spends the same Bitcoin, only this time gives you two thousandths of a Bitcoin. So it pays for both of the pieces of content. Now, you hold that transaction anytime you want. You can sign it, cash it in, or you can wait. I read a third piece of content. I now sign for three thousandths of a Bitcoin because I've read three pieces of content. That means you can give me that third piece of content because you now have enough to make that payment if you wished. So both parties are re-signing the transaction yes. every time it is updated. So does that require me as the person who is receiving it to actually make a signature? Is this an automated process that's handled by the platform? It's an automated process that's handled by the platform, but we're not signing the same transaction over and over again. We're essentially creating a, a new transaction based on the same locked up money each time for more and more and more settlement of the micropayment. If this goes against the agreement that we had, then that I would reject the updated one that you've sent to me, and I would just broadcast the one that was the last good one that we actually agreed upon. If something goes wrong Correct. on either side of this equation, either party can do that. Correct. And so in the meantime, you can decide if you're going to give me more content by having me pledge more money from this multi-sig address in payment to you by signing a bigger amount over to you, and that's why you would give me more content. Okay, um, so the end lock time then is important here because it prevents the buyer, it prevents the person who makes the deposit from redeeming their deposit, getting it back before the period at which it's supposed to come back. Right. So on day one, I put the money into escrow and we both sign a 30 day refund for the entire amount. On day two, I sign a thousandth of that amount over to you with a 29 day delay. On day three, I sign two thousandths of that amount with a 28 day lock. And on the last day, I sign the entire amount over with a zero day lock. You can then choose which of these to cash. So we, we always maintain a stable balance. Where are these transactions stored that aren't immediately being processed? Like, are they in the nodes in the Bitcoin network in the pool of unmined transactions or are they on the nope. client? Are they, where are they? Let's Talk Bitcoin would basically hold them in basically a pool, a storage pool. So they're not on the Bitcoin network? No. They okay. hold these partial transactions, partially signed in a pool, and these act as a guarantee of future payment. And then at the end of the month, they take the one that corresponds to the content that the other person has watched, the last one really, which serves as settlement for the entire amount discard all of the others, countersign that last one, inject it into the network, and essentially make the one transaction that settles the entire bill for the month. So they better not lose those in the month. Yes, it's a pretty smart system. And you can introduce all kinds of other tricks into there. You could have more than two parties. You could have a third party acting as escrow for refunds. You could have all kinds of things like that. Or based on the Lightning Network, you can do this in a complete hub and spoke system where you have multiple participants participating in the pool, which makes it even more efficient. It's a bit more complicated to explain, but imagine if a hundred readers of Let's Talk Bitcoin content all pledged money into a single multi-signature address and then 
each one partially signed a transaction for the balance to Let's Talk Bitcoin in increments for every piece of content they watched or read or listened to. So these technologies really represent a a culmination of two building blocks in Bitcoin used in a very, very smart and innovative mashup together, producing a very novel way of doing micropayments without the burden of huge fees, without the burden on the blockchain of having lots and lots and lots of transactions, while making it extremely flexible for end users to do this. And these technologies are now going into production for real uses like watching videos. Uh, and soon I, I'm hoping things like renting Wi-Fi time. Uh, and, and what's really exciting about all of this technology is that these are things you simply can't do with traditional payment systems. So we're beginning to see really the areas of innovation in Bitcoin beginning to push into areas that have never been done before. Are there any gotchas from using this? Because, I mean, thinking about it, you know, the concerns that I basically had were around centralization or control or the ability, you know, lacking a blockchain to actually make sure people are staying honest. How are people going to do that? But, you know, but uh, because both parties hold the tool necessary to make the entire transaction chain valid, you know, they can't act unilaterally without the uh, other party agreeing. It seems like that actually isn't so much of a problem here. So are there any threats or or issues that have, have already been identified? There's all kinds of scenarios that you could think of, but the underlying guarantees provided by multi-signature and and lock time and the fact that these are then validated by the consensus rules of the network can be used as trust primitives to build these more complex services in a way that is completely trusted, but at the same time, completely decentralized. It strikes me that this might even be more decentralized than the way that we do things now, because while now the unspent transactions is essentially a centralized pool, it's a decentralized, centralized pool of this value. And so if you move all of these things or you move a lot of the transactions onto these payment channels, they're not broadcasting up to the network. So the visibility of the network seems like it, you know, I'm not, right. I'm, I'm not sure if that's right. <laughs> what you're doing here is you're taking the settlements and, and moving parts of it into an even more decentralized peer-to-peer system. You could envision using this for a lot of things, not just micropayments. You could use the same payment channel technology to offer essentially consumer protection in the form of time-triggered refunds and third-party escrow and arbitration services. So you could do a payment channel between three parties, whereby you pay a merchant for flat-screen TV, and as part of that payment, you have an automatic 30-day refund. Or you time delay the payment so that your your payment only executes automatically in 30 days if there isn't a dispute. So the merchant knows that they will get their money in 30 days if there's no dispute. But if there is a dispute, then a third party can step in and do an escrow transaction to essentially refund the consumer. You could put the burden either way you want. So you can create a very sophisticated, programmable consumer protection. That's what I like to call it, programmable consumer protection. And this is really sophisticated tools can be built on top of this. And we're beginning to see really all of these building blocks of trust being recombined into these novel combinations. And the innovation is amazing. Streamium means that you can now do things like citizen journalism for pay. You could do sports events without the big channels monopolizing the situation. You could do peer-to-peer music performances or concerts where the viewers pay directly for this without having to make a huge commitment. You know, you don't have to buy the Manu Pacao Mayweather entire thing for $99.99. You can buy three seconds of it or you can, you can commit to the whole thing and then only watch three seconds and only pay for three seconds. You have all of this flexibility now, no doubt. The first application is probably going to be porn. As always, that drives a lot of technology, but the possibilities are really endless as to what you could do with per second billing on any platform with these micropayments. Thanks for listening to this episode of Let's Talk Bitcoin. Content for today's episode was provided by Andreas, Stephanie, and Adam. Music for this episode was provided by Jared Rubens. This episode was edited by Adam B. Levine. The magic word for episode 219 is off. That's O-F-F. Off. 
You've got until about 10 a.m. Pacific time on the 13th of June to visit letstalkbitcoin.com or the Let's Talk Bitcoin iOS app to enter it for your share of the listener awards. See you next time. produziere ich nur Videos in Englisch und Spanisch. Pero hoy voy a hacer otra excepción y traducirlo también en alemán. But today I make another exception and translate it into German too. Aber heute werde ich nochmal eine Ausnahme machen und es auch in Deutsch übersetzen. Ya algunas semanas tengo escrito en mi lista de tareas por hacer de traducir el video hashtag BTC4. Now already some weeks ago I have written on my to-do list to translate the video BTC4, hashtag BTC4. Schon seit ein paar Wochen habe ich äh, auf meiner To-Do-Liste geschrieben, ähm, den Video im BTC4 in Deutsch zu übersetzen. Estoy segura que esta idea puede ayudar a mucha gente económicamente. I'm sure that this can help many people economically. Ich bin sicher, dass diese Idee vielen Leuten äh, finanziell helfen kann. Y da motivación para aprender Bitcoin. And give motivation to learn about Bitcoin. Und Motivation geben, um über Bitcoin zu lernen. En este momento el precio de Bitcoin es muy bajo, económico. At the moment the price of Bitcoin is very low, economic. Im moment ist der Preis von Bitcoin sehr tief. Sería el momento ideal para invertir. Hoy es el 15 de abril 2015 would be the ideal moment to invest. Today is April 15th, 2015. Es wäre der ideale Moment zu investieren. Heute ist der 15. April 2015. El 27 de marzo 2015 he publicado en mi canal de YouTube Vanos Enigma el primer video sobre hashtag BTC4 explicando cómo me vino esta idea. On March 27th of 2015, um, I published my for the first video about hashtag BTC4 in my channel YouTube Vanos Enigma, explaining how I got the idea. Am 27. März 2015 habe ich in meinem YouTube-Channel Vanos Enigma den ersten, den ersten Video über Hashtag BTC4 veröffentlicht und äh, erzählt, erklärt, wie ich diese Idee bekommen habe. La idea consiste principalmente en lo siguiente. The idea mainly consists in the following. Die idea besteht hauptsächlich en folgendem. 
imprimir en direcciones de Bitcoin en papel. Diez o mínimo diez o mejor cien. To print Bitcoin directions in paper. At least ten or better hundred. Bitcoin adressen in Papier ausdrucken, um, mínimo 100 o besser gleich 100. Y luego poner en cada dirección de Bitcoin una pequeña cantidad de Bitcoin. And then put in every Bitcoin direction a little amount of Bitcoin. Und dann in jede Bitcoin-Adresse eine kleine Summe von Bitcoin transferieren. Y la próxima vez, cuando otra vez ves una persona por la calle pidiendo dinero. And the next time you see again a person begging for money on the street. Und das nächste Mal, wenn du wieder eine Person auf der Straße betteln siehst. Y para tus amigos y amigas. And for your friends, of course. Und für deine Freunde natürlich. O tal vez eh, de Probina en un restaurante. Or maybe a tip in a restaurant. Oder Trinkgeld im Restaurant. Bueno, a la hora de imprimir también copiar y guardar las llaves privadas de Bitcoin, de direcciones de Bitcoin. When you print the Bitcoin addresses, um, copy and save the private keys of the Bitcoin addresses, of course. Wenn man die Bitcoin-Adressen druckt, auch die, äh, auch die privaten Schlüssel, Bitcoin-Adress-Schlüsseln, ähm, kopieren und speichern. Y a la hora de distribuir las direcciones de Bitcoin, escribir la fecha, por ejemplo, hoy es el 15 de... Abril 2015, escribir la fecha, más plus cuatro años, uh, igual 15 de abril 2019. And then in the moment when you distribute uh, the Bitcoin addresses, you write the date, for example, today, April 15th, 2015. Plus, plus four years uh, is April 15th, 2019. Und dann in dem Moment, wenn man die Bitcoin-Adressen verteilt, auf das Papier schreiben, das heutige Datum, zum Beispiel 15. April 2015, plus... Vier Jahre ist gleich 15.04.2019. Luego vas a explicar a la gente, mira, esta es la llave privada. Tú y yo la tengo, la tienes. Si no quitas, transfieres este dinero de Bitcoin, eh, en estos cuatro años yo lo vuelvo a tener. Then you explain to the people, look, this is the private key. I have it and you have it. If you don't take this money, Bitcoin, out of this account, I will take it out in, this, um, in these four years, at the end of these four years. 
Und dann erklärst du den Leuten, ciao, das ist der private Schlüssel. Ähm, ich und du haben diesen privaten Schlüssel, Bitcoin-Schlüssel. Wenn du äh, bis Ende dieser vier Jahre das Geld Bitcoin nicht raus tust, transfer, äh, dann hole ich es zurück. De esta forma, das más motivación a la gente para empezar a aprender cómo funciona Bitcoin. This way, you give more motivation to the people to learn how the technology of Bitcoin functions. Auf diese Weise gibst du mehr Motivation den Leuten zu lernen, wie die Technologie von Bitcoin funktioniert. In my video Antigo. English, Espanol, video mix number 25, video mix numero 25. This time I want to talk especially about hashtag JCCVW, which I created some time ago, abbreviation for Justice Court Comedy and Virtual Worlds. Esta vez quiero hablar especialmente sobre el tema hashtag JCCVW que el hashtag que he creado hace algún tiempo so, que, eh, y es la abreviación por eh, justicia, Justice Court Comedy in Virtual Worlds, eh, justicia, comedia de justicia en mundos virtuales. I made already several videos about this hashtag. Uh, ya he hecho varios videos sobre este hashtag. But this time, especially thinking of my last video, number 24, uh, Robot Ethics. Pero esta vez, especialmente pensando en mi último video, eh, video mix número 24, Robot Ethics, Ética de Robots. First, I want to mention uh, the episode of Simpsons, Treehouse of Horror, number 13. Primero quiero men mencionar el, el episodio. El episodio de Simpsons número 13, Tree House of Horror, número 13. Just a side note, it's uh, astonishing uh, now many years in Spanish TV uh, and at lunchtime and in the evening they are still showing about half an hour or more. Uh, Simpsons, many years now. Uh, es asombroso. Um, ya muchos años que por el mediodía y también por la, por la noche enseñan por lo menos media hora de los Simpsons en la televisión española. Did you hear of the term Simpsonology? Has oído de, del término Simpsonología? 
Simpson. 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 Simpsonology. Simpson. Simpsonology. Maybe I'll check out if it in Spanish Simpsonologia. Long story short, the moral of the, this episode of The Simpsons, the animals have more ethics than humans. Resumiendo este episodio, Los Simpsons, uh, los animales tienen más ética que los humanos. Remember my last video number, video mix number 24, robot ethics, cat ethics. Recuerda mi uh, último video mix número 24, robot ethics, ética de robots and cat ethics, ética de gatos. And with a funny gif. GIF is abbreviation for graphic interchange format. Y con un gracioso GIF. GIF. Maybe it's a little bit helpful, helpful to compare robot ethics and cat ethics. Tal vez uh, ayuda a comparar un poco el ética de robots y ética de gatos. Once I said to my mom, uh, talking with this person is like uh, teaching, teaching ethics to cats. Una vez he dicho a mi madre, mira, hablando con esa persona es como uh, enseñar ética a, a gatos. They just do what they want. Solo sim simplemente hacen lo que quieren. And the robots do what they are programmed to do. Y los robots hacen simplemente lo que están programados de hacer. The question is the responsibility. La cuestión es la responsabilidad. So in the end, you see, it's almost not controllable. Así que verás que al final no es controlable. But normal cats can never turn as evil as humans. Pero gatos normales nunca pueden volverse tan eh, malos, hacer cosas tan malas como los humanos. Perversion, perversión, opposite land, el país de justo todo al revés, copyright, copy prohibition, el copyright es más bien no un derecho de copiar sino una prohibición de copia, copiar, law of intellectual property, la ley de la propiedad intelectual. Especially because I like to produce video mix, I got very angry about the legal system and the perverse law of intellectual property, which inhibits innovation and freedom of expression. Especialmente porque me gusta producir video mix. Uh, me Enfade con el sistema legal, en especialmente, el, especialmente la ley de la propiedad intelectual que inhibe la innovación y la libertad de expresión. And if you continue to think about the legal system, uh, you more and more doubts. Y si continúas de pensar sobre el sistema legal, vas a tener más y más dudas. But still, you have, I think it's important to have a place to talk about ethics. 
pero igualmente pienso que es importante de tener un lugar donde se hable sobre ética. That's the main motivation why I created hashtag JCC VW, Justice Card Comedy in Virtual Worlds. Es la motivación principal por la que he creado el hashtag JCCVW, Just, Justice Card Comedy in Virtual Worlds, Justicia, Comedia de Justicia en Mundos Virtuales. Even on my main Twitter account, Planos Enigma, the cover picture, uh, I've got written justice, who has the right to judge, who is without sin, cast the first stone. Hasta en mi cuenta de Twitter principal, Planos Enigma, tengo um, a cover, um, a la imagen de cover, escrito justicia. ¿Quién tiene el derecho de juzgar? ¿Quién está sin pecado que tire la primera piedra? And it's astonishing how often the Simpsons show some kind of court comedies. Y es asombroso cuántas veces en los Simpsons enseñan algún tipo de comedias de juicios. I want to remember especially the lawsuit or court comedy of Homer Simpson when he sold his soul to the devil, Ned Flanders. Especialmente quiero recordar el juicio de Homer Simpson cuando vendió su alma al diablo, uh, Ned Flanders. In normal legal system, the question is always, is it legal or is it illegal? En el sistema legal, eh, normalmente la, la pregunta es, ¿es legal o es ilegal? But it's more important to ask, is it, is it ethical, is it right or is it wrong? Es más importante preguntar es está bien o mal es ético no no es ético. Did you hear of the term jury nullification? Has oído de este término ahora no sé en español pero eh, uno tiene el derecho de decir que por ejemplo no culpable porque la ley es injusta. You have the right to say it's uh, not guilty because the law is not just unjust. I want to remember especially the case of Ross Albrecht, Free Ross, hashtag Free Ross, Dread Pirate, Silk Road. Especialmente quiero recordar el juicio de Ross Albrecht, um, Silk Road, Bitcoin, and my profile picture of Innocent Crypto Kitty, y mi imagen de perfil Innocent Crypto Kitty, que quiere decir uh, uh, gatito inocente de criptografía. But it's medical catnip. Pero es catnip médico. 30 years of jail for running a website which other people used for buying and selling catnip. 30 años de cárcel por hacer una página web que otras personas han usado para comprar y vender catnip. And I want 
to remember what said Roger Ware, uh, Bitcoin Jesus. He said something like, uh, the war against drugs cause more harm than the drugs themselves. Y quiero recordar lo que dijo Roger Ware, que es como el Bitcoin, el Jesús de Bitcoin, dijo algo como que la guerra contra las drogas causan más daño que las drogas mismas. Okay, let's go back to even if you would have want to have a person like ah and not just Roger Ware, uh, the case of Charlie Shrin, another Bitcoiner. A very interesting case too and one interview um, I made a video um, very interesting comment of Andreas Antonopoulos in one episode of Let's Talk Bitcoin I think it's the video mix number Yes, I had just a look. It's video mix number 17. Uh, justo he mirado es el video mix número 17 uh, con Charlie Shrem. Uh, this comment I like too much, so I will paste it. Uh, just paste it here. Este comentario me gusta demasiado, así que uh, algunos minutos uh, voy a pegar. Este momento. Podcast can agree to the fact that whatever we have in this country that passes for a justice system has at least three tiers. There are, you know, people at the top who get infinite, infinite forgiveness for some of the most disgusting mega crimes and never face the tiniest consequence for their actions. You can put a million people out of their homes with fraudulent foreclosures. And you'll never see the inside of a courtroom. You can rig markets, steal money from investors, defraud millions of people. You'll never see the inside of a courtroom. And yet, there's the other side of the scale where you have a situation of zero tolerance, where the slightest infraction, selling a loose cigarette for 30 cents, gets you a street side arrest judgment and execution by strangulation, where jaywalking gets you shot by a cop, even if you're unarmed, and where cities run effectively debtors prisons where they rotate people through there for traffic fines and keep accumulating them until they end up in jail for violating subpoenas and things like that and run it as a for-profit enterprise and then in the middle is the middle class caught in this justice system this thin layer that's getting thinner all the time because they're getting squeezed from the bottom and the middle class sees the top of this country getting away with uh, mega crimes and sees a wave of zero tolerance coming at them that used to only affect minorities but now is increasingly taking bites out of the middle class. And they're struggling desperately not to fall into this Orwellian zero tolerance justice system. That's not justice. I think everyone on this call probably has a similar perspective to this, but effectively what we're talking about is an erosion of the rule of law. And the most fundamental concept of the rule of law is equality in judgment. If a law exists, there is one tier. Everybody faces the same consequences for breaking that law. And that fundamental social compact has been violated. And for some stratum of the society, it never really existed. You know, some people were always going to feel the heavy boot of law um, with no recourse and um, suffered under that for 200 years. Uh, but now that is increasingly becoming the vast majority of the population. So you live in a society where 
the slightest mistake is very harshly punished. That's if you survive the police encounter. Um, while you watch a country's so-called elite just roll from scandal to scandal, from crime to crime, with no one going to jail. War crimes, no jail time. Bank fraud, no jail time. All of these things, you know, surveillance and violating the constitutional rights of millions of people, not even a misdemeanor issue. It just gets legalized after the fact. Lying to Congress, no problem. And then Preet can promote his resume by going after Charlie. It's really a disgusting situation, but I think it's, it's a situation that has nothing to do with Bitcoin per se. It's just a universal collapse of justice and the rule of law in this country. One of the few countries that actually had it. As I was so well said, I have no response to it. I, I completely agree with Andreas, everything he just said. It's, it's, it's not limited to, to Bitcoin. It's, a, it's an overall, you see it, you see it with everything. I mean, look at the case of Aaron Schwartz. May he rest in peace. But once they have their sights on you, telling it's you per se, I think it's what you represent or who you are. Um, there's no getting out of those sites and the higher up you are, the harder it is for them to prosecute you. It just doesn't make sense for them. Our justice system has been corrupted or viewed to, to, to what it is today. And I created the hashtag Let's Talk Justice, or maybe a better hashtag Let's Talk Ethics. I also created a hashtag Let's Talk Justice, Let's Talk Justice, but maybe it's better Let's Talk Ethics, Let's Talk Justice. After this part of video mix number 17, I will paste a short video comparison of the two uh, websites of Wikipedia about this episode of Simpson Treehouse of Horror number 13. Y después de esa parte del video mix número 17 voy a pegar un pequeño video en una comparación entre las dos páginas de Wikipedia en inglés, en español. I forgot to say in English, in comparison between English and Spanish of the episode of the Simpsons Treehouse of Horror, eh, perdón, español ahora, eh, comparación del episodio de Simpson Treehouse of Horror número 13. Comparing hashtag JCCVW to uh, the real legal system, of course, there is no such thing like judgment, rather a fiction punishment. Comparando JCCVW, comparándolo con el sistema legal, por supuesto no hay tal cosa como un una sentencia de juicio más bien un, un castigo ficticio. Just want to remember you, I have that uh, Twitter account Soul Trade Game in virtual worlds like Second Life with, with Virtual Guide Dog. Uh, recordar que tengo la cuenta en Twitter que se llama Soul Trade Game 
traducido juego de negocios de almas. Es como un juego en mundos virtuales como Second Life. Especially interesting for cats and blind people. Especialmente interesante para gatos y personas que estén ciegos o tengan problemas con los ojos or people blind or people who have problems with the eyes. The bra anyway, watch my videos about Soul Trade Game. De toda forma mirad mis videos sobre Soul Trade Game, juego ne de negocio de almas. And I have that Twitter account Soul, uh, sorry, Soul Confiscator Catch. Y tengo este, esta cuenta de Twitter, Soul Confiscator Cat. You are welcome on all of my Twitter accounts. Normally I follow back. Estáis bienvenidos en todas mis cuentas de Twitter. Normalmente sigo de vuelta. So you see I have a double or triple interest to open hashtag JCCVW. Así que veis que tengo un doble o triple interés de abrir el hashtag JCCVW. Justice Club Comedy in Virtual Worlds. Ah, what I wanted to say before about the jury nullification. Uh, if you really would like to to um, participate in a trial lawsuit uh, to help uh, somebody from getting declared guilty fast. You have to take vacation. You have to buy a flight to New York. And I think this trial was in January of um, Free Ross, Ross Albrecht, um, Silk Road. So, bueno, lo que iba a decir antes uh, con respecto al derecho de uh, Renalification en español no me acuerdo how so, no estoy segura pero que tienes el derecho de decir que mira yo estoy uh, no estoy de acuerdo que esta persona sea declarada culpable oh, así que primero tendrías que tomar vacaciones comprar un vuelo a Nueva York y uh, era ese juicio me parece era en, en enero cuando hizo un montón de frío. So comparing this legal system with uh, hashtag JCCVW, this is in, in, in virtual worlds. Everybody can participate and talk about ethics, right or wrong. Don't need to buy a flight to New York. Uh, comparando ahí con el sistema legal. No, eso tiene que tiene lugar en mundos virtuales. No hay que comprar un vuelo a Nueva York y tanto, tanto esfuerzo para participar en un juicio, discutir sobre ética. Puedes fácilmente participar de cualquier lugar, ordenador, P2P. And especially talking about robot ethics, this will be very important in the future. Y especialmente el tema de ética de robots en el futuro será muy importante. Because it's easy to say that the person who programmed the robot is responsible for the actions, but uh, it's very easy to uh, to hide the identity who programmed the robot. Es muy fácil decir que la persona que ha 
programado el robot es responsable por las acciones del robot pero es muy fácil de ocultar la identidad de la persona que ha programado el robot so now I